My name is Chip Rossetti. I'm the editorial director of the Library of Arabic Literature book series. Um, and just briefly before I introduce our uh, main speaker today, um, the Library of Arabic Literature um, is, uh, began with a grant from NYU Abu Dhabi Institute in 2010. So we're now in our 14th year. We've been publishing books since uh, December 2012 was our first book. Um, and our aim is to publish significant works of Arabic literature, primarily from the pre-Islamic period up to really the cusp of the modern period, Nakhda and beyond. Uh, and our range of books, as so is described on our, our website, is, is equally wide. Um, so anything from poetry, poetics, uh, uh, history, literature, science, philosophy, religion, uh, including a cookbook. Um, so we, we intentionally keep it broad. Um, and books in the series are edited and translated by internationally recognized scholars. Um, and they are published, first of all, in parallel text editions with Arabic and English. I just brought one from my um, office. Uh, this is Ibn al-Motez, uh, Hunting Poems by uh, poet Ibn al-Motez from the Abbasid period, uh, one of several books of hunting poetry we're doing, uh, edited and translated by James Montgomery, who's our executive editor, one of our executive editors. Uh, after the books come out in hardcover and bilingual editions, we then publish them in um, English-only paperbacks with uh, some more trade-friendly covers. This is actually a, a, our latest one, which is uh, uh, translated by uh, Dr. Philip Kennedy, who is our general editor, and uh, Jeremy Farrell. Um, this is in Budlan, Dr.'s dinner party, a uh, satirical take on the medical profession. Um, so just briefly, um, LAL encourages scholars to produce authoritative Arabic editions accompanied by modern lucid English translations. Um, so that makes a good segue to our speaker today, David Larson, who is doing just that, uh, working on an edition and translation of the poetry of the Umayyad era Udhri poet, Jamil Buthena. And just a little bit about David, he's a US poet and translator, currently senior research fellow at the Library of Arabic Literature. Um, this is his second year as a, as a fellow, senior fellow with LAL. Um, he studied comparative literature at UC Berkeley, has taught since then at Yale and Ohio State, and at NYU in the Liberal Studies program, where he's a faculty member. He's also the author of two books of poetry, the most recent, which I have here, uh, Zeros Were Hollow, um, which is a, quite a, a very interesting uh, collection of poems, um, which came out in 2022 from Kenning Editions in Chicago. Um, his translation of The Names of the Lion by Ibn Khalaway from Wave Books in Seattle will be joined next year by another work of Arabic uh, lexicography from Wave Books, uh, and which is The Book of Rain by Abu Zaid al-Ansari. And his talk today is The Bend in Arabic, Metaphors to Lean By in the Poetry of Jamil Fulena. David. Thanks, everyone, <clears throat> for being here. And to Alex and to Raya. And again, to Chip, this is a, kind of a flashback for us. We appeared together at a lunchtime talk at Kavokin Center. We think it's about five or six years ago. And I, in my imaginary trajectory of how I got to Abu Dhabi, that was the launch pad. So thank you, Chip. It's good to be together again. Um, and this is round 2.0, by the way, for uh, Jamil at HRF. Uh, the purpose of my talk in 2023 was to introduce the poet, Jamil ibn Ma'mar al-Udri, that are known as Jamil Buthayna, and to sketch out the editorial project that brought me to Abu Dhabi and keeps me here. Today's talk is different. I'd like to share some things that Jamil and his poetry have taught me. It's not exactly wisdom, but it is all true. In reality, this is something between, uh, I guess you could call it speculative linguistics, if that's a thing, or philosophy of language, perhaps. Um, or maybe it's just a poet's essay. Um, the metaphors through which we make sense of experience, playing obviously on the title by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson. Now, it may not be obvious why bending and leaning are a philosophical problem until you see how many realms of experience are united by the bend in Arabic. 
I'm going to let them unfold slowly in this order. First, we're going to look at leaning and bending as idioms of eros, erotic desire. Then there's a bend that's a defect in what's supposed to be straight. And the lean that's a defect in what's supposed to be perpendicular and erect. Thirdly, there's the bend that's a turn aside from the path you're on. Not a bend in the road, but a bend away from the road, a deviation. And as we'll see in Arabic, these meanings are all intertwined. And in some ways, they're all the same meaning along different axes. And throughout, we'll consider their significance in the surviving poetry and legendary career of Jamil Muthaina. There is precedent for this kind of speculative linguistics in the work of Ahmed Faris of Shidyak. We all know his Sak al -Sak in the two volume LAL editions with the long philological digressions, but they don't stop there. In 1886, he published Sir Layal Fil Qalb which means the night secrets on permutation and metathesis. And in the introduction to this work, he goes on for five dense pages about words for cutting and all the idioms they're enlisted in. Al cut, well, ahawatuha, he calls them cutting and its sisters. You can cut across something, you can cut it out, you can cut around it, and so on. The most full of profundities, like sometimes cutting improves a thing, and sometimes it causes damage. And I'm not being sarcastic, that really is profound. And I take Shedyak's interest in words for cutting as encouragement, that my interest in verbs for bending isn't totally idiotic. On the right, there's uh, Ojasus al Kamus. That's interesting too, the snooper into the dictionary. But let me move on to inclinations by Adriana Caballero. Uh, its subtitle is A Critique of Rectitude. And I can't say enough. This, this, this preference in Western thought for what is straight and upright is so pervasive as to be nearly undetectable unless you spent time with Cavadero's book. How many times have we been told that erect posture is what separates humankind from the other animals, freeing us for skilled handwork and philosophical contemplation? And straightness, um, the crooked timber of humanity, this is an image that Kant was especially fond of. This is uh, an engraving, Foucault reproduces this in Discipline and Punish. Um, and Cavaretto has a lot to say about Kant. Her sixth chapter is a polemic. It's about a polemic that Kant had with an anatomist who thought that human beings were originally quadrupeds. Um, and there's a lot to be said about this. Kant was also uh, averse to motherhood and childcare. And Cavaretto says this was no coincidence. Only for a mother is it a virtue to be always bending over. And this is why um, this cover illustration was chosen for the U.S. edition, Leonardo's painting of the Madonna and child sitting in the lap of St. Anne. And she makes this point about Leonardo's Madonnas, is that unlike usually you see the Madonna and child, it's a very upright static pose. For Leonardo, she's always bending over, her arms are outstretched. Um, now on the subject of Eros, Cavadero refers frequently to Hannah Arendt's observation that Inclination is always a lean away from the self. Every inclination turns outward, she says. It leans out of the self in the direction of whatever may affect me from the outside world. And this is what makes love perilous. It's a forfeit of, a forfeit of one's uprightness. And to quote Cavadero, it is a threat to the subject's equilibrium, a deep quiver, a slippery slope, and I think you'll appreciate this is not just metaphor. It's more like a symptom that's coeval with the affection. It's affect, in other words. Um, you might even catch yourself leaning towards someone before you're aware of their attraction, right? We lean towards the beloved, lessening the space between us. And in my view, the idiom of inclination 
is more accurate than attraction for human beings or human bodies, that is, who have to cope with gravity on Earth. Attraction might happen on a space station or in some other weightless medium, but um, here on Earth, we lean, right? Our body moves in the direction of the beloved while our feet are planted or our butt is in a chair. Um, this was underlined for me uh, negatively uh, by a passage in the Meccan Revelations where Ibn Arabi says that Eros is of two kinds, natural and elemental, al-hub al-tabi'i, wal-hub al unsuri My paraphrase begins uh, the third line down here in the slide where he says, natural love doesn't discriminate between attractive forms. He says it's like static electricity. It'll stick to practically anything. Meanwhile, elemental love is attraction to one form only. And Ibn Arabi illustrates it with the famous love poets of, of early Islam. It's like what Qais felt for Layla, he says, or the other Qais for Lubna, or Kuthayr for Azza, or Jamil for Buthayna. And then he says, this is like the magnet's attraction to iron, Kamagnatis al-Hadid. And these are amazing similes. They're distinct interest to the history of science, and they are completely foreign to Jamil, which is why I bring them up to underline our focus today on the terms Jamil actually uses, rather than projecting new ones onto his poetry, for which there is a lot of temptation because the Arabic vocabulary of love is so vast. Abu Mansur al classifies words for love by degree in his Fiqh al -Nuga. First, he says there's Hawa, and then there's Alaka, and then Kalaf, and then Ishq, and then Sha'af, Sha'af, Jawa, Time, Tabul, Huyum, and by that point, you are beyond rescue. Um, you could say that this is the lexicographical version of Ibn Adam. Um, and and this isn't what the talk about talks about either. Degree and intensity, no. The words we're after today signify bending, leaning, and going astray. Mm -hmm. And the most basic term for this is mile. The infinitive form of mala yamilu, in terms of eros, it's almost defensible to translate mile as love object. Except that mala yamilu is an intransitive verb. It takes no direct object. You could call the beloved, um, al -ma al <laughs> no one ever says this, al mamul ilay, but it's not a common phrase. Mile signifies the postural experience of the leaner and the lover. And for better or for worse, the beloved isn't necessarily affected by it at all. Um, one thing that showed me that I was onto something with this term was learning from Sagan al Mari that mile was proposed as a legal diagnostic in cases of the intersex body. Here we're looking at the beginning of chapter six. That's the rubrication in the, I forget how many lines down, 10 lines, 12 lines. Uh, the text is called Idah al Mushkil, the Ahkam al Khunta al Mushkil by Abdul Rahim al Isnawi. Um, and this is one of four manuscripts that Sagar used for his critical edition of the text. Whose title he translates as clarification of the problems in the rulings of the uncertain Huntha. This chapter deals with how to classify the intersex subjects in cases where that's not possible through empirical observation. In these cases, the text says you have to ask the subject, which way do you lean? And if the subject says, I desire women. And I'm inclined by my nature for them, then we use that as evidence for his maleness and vice versa. And if the subject says, I am inclined to both of them similarly, or I am not inclined to either, then Z is an uncertain junta. And it's in this uncertain case, a junta al mushkil, that gives al Nawi's text its title. Now, before we look at these terms in Jamil, let's have a quick reintroduction to the poet in the copy for today's talk. He's, I wish we could use that as the cover. I love these 
Dodd saw the um the bow and fiddle and uh anyway so uh we call him the first great love poet of the Arabs which is what everyone says about him he wasn't the first of course there were love crazed poets before him like Urwa ibn Hazam of the previous generation or Abdullah ibn Ajlan in the pre-Islamic period and Jamil who's really Umayyad stands at the head of all the other poets mentioned by Ibn Arabi a little bit ago for his disappointed love for a woman named Muthaina, he became so famous that her name replaced his patronym and his tribal surname. And this set the pattern for Kais Lubna, Kothaya Azza, and Majnun Leila. It's funny to think that if Muthaina's family had permitted their union, that her name would be lost to history, and Jamil would be remembered, if at all, as a local poet of Wadi al Qura, which is the valley north of Medina along the pilgrimage route from Syria, now called Wadi al Ula. Very, very roughly, it's in the area of the lavender patch I've placed on this 16th century map, a printed map of uh, uh, the Geographia of Ptolemy. But through the refusal of Buthina's family and his resulting torrent of love complaint, he came to be called Jamil Buthina and their names have never been forgotten. Uh, they both belonged to a West Arabian tribe called Udra. And this is why I did this. In this close up, you can see the Udris, the Athritai, as Ptolemy calls them back in the second century of the common era. So they're an ancient tribe, a noble tribe aligned with Quraysh, and allegedly the first tribe to pay the Sadaqa tax to Muhammad. Although they were never politically prominent in Islam, and after the third or fourth century of Islam, they kind of disappear. Um, this makes it easy to dress them up in fantasy, giving rise to the concept of Udri love which is imagined as a chaste and platonic form of attachment that's purely spiritual. I need to be respectful about this because it's a cherished cultural template. And um, my, my guide and my predecessor, Hussein Nassad, who was Jamil's greatest editor of the modern period, he made a subtitle of his Diwan, Collected Poems of Jamil, Poetry of Udri Love. Inevitably, there will be disappointed readers of the LAL volume who go looking for Udri love, only to find shaky grounds for it in the poetry, which is neither chaste nor genteel. I'm lucky to be able to refer readers to Joha al Harthi's book, where the fiction is largely dismantled. My personal surmise is that the concept of Udri love came not from the poetry of Jamil but from prose narrations. I mean, the Akhbar, where he and Buthaina spent whole nights together, unchaperoned, in a thicket or a tent, and always the narrator hastens to add that they sat apart from each other, that their conversation <laughs> was chaste and decorous. And if you don't tell the story that way, then Jamil and Buthaina would be ordinary adulterers. And that is not the character that either of them embody. But it's not enough to say that Udri loves a myth and not put something in its place. Um, I owe it to Jamil's readers to be able to sketch out the rhetoric and the vocabulary that we do find in his corpus. Keeping in mind that it has to be assembled from different sources. There was a Diwan of Jamil, a volume of his collected poems in the Abbasid periods, but it's lost now. And when you gather up what's left, a lot of verses come with colorful prose reports attached, and these are part of the corpus too. On the subject of Jamil and gender, there is an important report to consider, very widely quoted. Tim McIntosh Smith includes it in his book, Arabs. Abu Faraj relates it twice within eight pages of the Book of Songs. And at first I was disgusted because I have to edit the thing and there's no difference in wording. And I was like, why would you do this? Um, now, I kind of think it's there to make us pay attention. The poet doesn't even appear in the report. Rather, it's commentary on one of Jamil's verses by one Saleh, 
Ibn Hassan, Hassan, excuse me, a discredited Hadith scholar. It goes like this. al Haytham Ibn Adiv said, I was asked by Saleh, do you know a verse of poetry divided in such a way that one half is by a Bedouin in a cloak of hair and the other a Muhannif of al aqib who goes all to pieces? The word Muhannif, you should know, is from the same word, uh, the same root as Huntha, which we heard just before. Whereas a Huntha is an actual intersex person, a Muhannif is a man of effeminate manners, manners and dress. So, Oh, Haitham answers, no, I, I, I can't. Saleh says, I could give you a whole year to come up with it. And Oh, Haitham says, I still won't guess it. So the answer is, it's this verse by Jamil. Allah ayyuhan nuwamu wa hukumu hubbu usa ilukum al yaktalur rajal al hubbu. Oh, sleepers, awake and beware, I ask you. Can love kill a man? Uh, if, in case you're wondering, it's a, it's a place near Medina. It was the haunt of a singer named Ibn Aisha, who was the son of an unwed hairdresser. And if I may, Ibn Aisha was a total muhannaf, and that explains al -Aqiyuk. What makes the second hemistich similar to muhannaf's speech is more or less spelled out. He goes all to pieces. To Saleh's mind, the speaker of the first hemistage sounds like a vigilant watchman. Yeah? Warning his companions who are probably asleep that there's danger coming. Only to cast martial valor aside and dissolve into lovelorn folly in the second hemistage. Now, in reports of Jamil's actual conduct, we don't see this kind of dereliction. He's an expert writer and fighter and gets himself out of many tight places. Although perhaps tellingly, these skills are only ever exercised against Berthina's male relatives, uh, and no one in these skirmishes is ever wounded. I think the main way to describe his character is to say that he's vulnerable, all of which makes it natural to wonder. What does Jamil's poetry say about lending, leaning and bending? The answer is, how much time do you have? Let's start with bending. Here are three verbs of bending within five verses from a poem in the anthology, Muntaha Talab. Wajidi adma'a tahnuhu ila rasha'in ahanna lam yattabiha mithlahu waladu. Her neck is like a tawny doze arching down to her fawn, the single born whose squeaking she attends to. Her limbs are soft and supple, and her flesh quivers, bending without creaking in her tent, plump at the anklets, filling out the wrapper down below a slender torso, spared the harm and stress of life, slim waisted from the front and big of bottom from behind, the woman's perfect, with no defect in her frame. No better blanket for a man out in the cold who takes her for his wrap when chills are frightful. And with the last verse, you see why the myth of chaste earthly love is on its way out. <laughs> but it's the verses leading up to it I want to focus on in reverse order. Awad, that's the word translated here as defect. This is a fairly common word for a bend in what's supposed to be straight. And we'll see it again soon. In Hidad, bending without breaking like a tender shoot, that's a rare one. Um, and at the very beginning, we have Hana Yahnu, for the bending of the gazelle's neck towards her young, a very common image in early Arabic love poetry. And it brings me to a hobby horse of mine, which is the tendency of moral and psychological word meanings to be based on concrete physical ones. Yeah. Everyone knows the word concept. <laughs> derives from the Latin concipity, which means to, to grip with the hand. Uh, Arabic is full of these, and Hana Yahnu illustrates the tendency for concrete and abstract meanings of a single verb to be marked by differences of vowel length. So here we have Hana Yahnu Hanwan in yellow, meaning to bend or to turn. And then in pink, Hana Yahni Onuwan, which is to feel affection, especially towards 
children. And I say this is my hobby horse because I'm the maniac who wrote 50 pages on how matna, the word for meaning, has roots in a verb of captivity. It's my first work of literary theory. In yellow, anayatnu means physical subjugation and captivity. That's for a prisoner of war who's bound on the battlefield. And then in pink, anayatni and aniyatni mean to be concerned, to be captivated noetically in the mind with some preoccupying or captivating situation. My 2018 article states the obvious. Uh, it's an enduring insight of the enlightenment. Psychological meanings are predicated on physical ones. Now, the funny thing about mana is that morphologically speaking, it's derived equally well from all three vowelings. And today I'm here to say some of these verbs of bending work the same way. Um, and with the verses we just saw, none of them were for the poet's inclination toward Buthina. Uh, for that, please consider this verse of Jamil's from Masari al Shak um, of Ja'far al-Saraj. Uh, I ponder some means of forgetting you, but then I am sent back to you by leanings that turn my steps to you. Here we have two bends in a single hemistitch. Alawatif are the poet's amatory leanings. And Thani is duplication and folding of every kind. And here it means causing someone to double back along the path they're traveling. Um, here's another one from a poem that mimes a monologue by Murthaina, beginning with these verses. And I'll read just the last one where she says, um, Restrain your gaze when you are among us. It makes your passion's inclination plain to see. Now, this is a case where love object would work in translation or the object of your affection. Um, the gaze is so well known as an outward sign of love that it needs no comment. I point us instead to Zaira, which in Surat al Imran means deviation in a moral sense. As for those with deviation in their hearts, <coughs> and then you, the rest of the ayah. Um, deviation is where this talk is going. But um, first a detour to the bookshop in London where I found this text by Abdul Rahman ibn Isa al-Hamadani, a grammarian I'd never heard of. You, 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 I know this one. You've come across? Yeah, I, I never one. had. That's fantastic. Yeah, so I have you know, he might have been Ibn Holloway's teacher back in the, he's too, too young, he's too old rather for mm -hmm. a generation before uh, um, Ibn Fadis or, mm -hmm. or uh, but he has a man. But anyway, um, here is his Babel Itwijaj, a chapter on distortion in its entirety. Awaj, Awaj, Dola, Mayal, Zawar, Zayl, Hino, and Sa'ad are said, Phil Had Hasatan, especially for the side of the face. Sawad and Sayed are upward bendings of the neck from hauteur and pride. Do I have the translation here? Yes, I do. Mayal is for a bend in the formation of a thing, as is Dala. And its affiliated verb is mayala yam yalu. Mayal is for inclination towards something in a psychological sense, min in the nafsi. And its affiliated verb is mala yamilu. One says ta'awwada of a thing and it waja, no, it wajja in aja and in ada when it bends. And while the contortion of some affair is called iwaj, the bending of a stick is called awaj. Uh, there's a lot to unpack here. I'll stick to two things. The first is that here again, we have shades of meaning distinguished by voweling. In pink type, awaj is for the bent stick and 
Illage is for an abstract matter that is bent in a metaphorical sense. That means, you know, tangled up. Um, the latter is heard several times in Quran with reference to the Quran itself. Surat al-Zumar, excuse me, I didn't have a slide for this. Verse 28 says, it is Quranan Arabian Waira the Iwaj. There is no contortion in Quran, meaning no evasive language. And now look at Mayal and Mayal in blue type. This one's complicated. Alhamdani construes them as an abstract concrete pair, just like Awaj Iwaj. Mayal is a bend in something's formation, and Mayal is min in the nefs. But there is another view on this in Lisan al Adam, the great dictionary of Ibn Mandur, where he says that Mayal, in the first of these two paradigms, is for leaning that is contingent to the hadith. In other words, you're not built that way, you just happen to be leaning. As opposed to Mayal in the second paradigm, which is for leaning that is congenital or structural, Lisan also gives the adjectival form amyal, describing someone with a bent body. Its feminine form is my la, and this was the nickname, the lakab, of one of Jamil's earliest musical interpreters, Azza al Maila, so called because she walked with an uneven gait. So the way Lisan does it, both vowelings are for physical states. Something can be inclined, ma'il, and still be well built. And if it's amyal, it's structurally flawed. But now I ask you, are these ever immoral states? Um, ethically speaking, I mean, take Mile. There is a wonderful dialogue poem, probably my favorite poem in the corpus, where Jamil takes Booth Fine at a court and he says, let's go before two judges, one from my group and one from yours impartial men and not unjust ones, where the phrase is hakamin la yamilu, that is a judge who doesn't lean prejudiciously towards either side. As for mayo, I invite you to try and come up with a word for crooked that has positive moral associations in any language. <laughs> if crook, the English word doesn't say at all, please consider my least favorite science fiction novel, yes. Out of the Silent Planet by C.S. Lewis. Um, it takes place on Venus, where the protagonist encounters a race of beings so innocent that their language doesn't have a word for evil or bad. So they have to use a word that means bent. It's not very quotable, except for this bit of dialogue um, that's about poetics. Okay, I'm sorry, this is actually kind of clever. Um, the most splendid line in a poem becomes only, it becomes fully splendid only by means of the lines after it, says the native of Venus. If you went back to it, you would find it less splendid than you thought. But in a bent poem, the earthling asks, to which the Venusian replies, tut tut, human, a bent poem is not listened to. Uh, Back now to al Hamadani and his babble it would judge. Um, I had a visceral response to the first sentence about distortions of the face. And I stood there in Dottel Hekma bookstore, right around the corner from the British Library, just gaping into this book until closing time. Um, the background on this is right on the surface of every face-to-face -face interaction that I have. Um, not that the face is the essence, but it is the face. 44 years I've been negotiating acute facial asymmetry, which in English we barely have words for. Um, facial difference is recent clinical language that I've embraced. And now here were eight new words for having a face that is misaligned right in front of them. Some of them are familiar to us, right? Zayr and Hanu, we've already encountered, where they mean affectionate inclination, and moderately so in the case of Zayr. Dala is another. It's cognate with Dal, 
which is sympathetic inclination. I'll come back to that in a little bit. Awad is the word I translated as defect in the big bottom poem. Burthina's body has no awad. So that's not a surprising word for facial deformity, and neither is sa'ad, which we hear in Quran. This is Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 18. Uh, not for a defect, but for a contingent expression on the face, a sneering expression. Mm. Twist not your cheek at people. And this hits home because it's a good rule, an excellent rule, not to use your face to make other people feel bad. On the other hand, to people who do not know me, and haven't figured out that I can't smile correctly, I look like more of a smirking jackass than I really am. <laughs> and now we're at a tricky point in my talk because I would love to build a critique of symmetry on Camarero's inclinations. On the subject of bent poetry, I could write a manifesto and start a hilarious movement that no one would join. <laughs> but on the real, if I were a carpenter sorting nails, I know which ones I'd throw away. And it pains me to say this, but I am in love with symmetrical smiles. <laughs> and I'm fascinated by eyes that open and close at the same time. It's like watching a well choreographed dance routine. Mm -hmm. And it's affecting for reasons that are not learned. Racism is learned. Preference for symmetry is innate is documented throughout the animal kingdom. And I do not know how to destabilize symmetrical privilege for you today. Can move on to more redemptive forms of bending. Dala, for example, might just answer my challenge of a minute ago. Here we have a verb of crookedness with positive associations. Um, it connects with Dala, which is like the Hanu and the mother gazelle. And to the la'a, which is strength. Imagine that. Arabic is notorious for verbs that mean one thing and its opposite. We call them al adad, but that's not the connection you're here. Your adla are your ribs. And if they're not bent, they serve no purpose. The best one is zawar. Zawar and zawar are like mayal, they're words for asymmetry. And azwar is like amyal. It describes something that's bent where others are straight. But some things don't work until they are bent, like a bow. And in Jamil, we find the feminine form, zawra, as an epithet for uh, exactly this, for the bow. What is the well-aimed arrow launched by an archer's hand from a string knotted at both ends? fletched with feathers from a black eagle's wing, all alike, tipped for the forking head like a za'ibi spear, sped from a bent bowl, a zaura bowl of grewia, whose string is strong, its timber well-aged. What's all that compared to my swift death on the day you shot me full of holes whose openings none can see? In an archer's bow, the bend is not a flaw. It's what makes it deadly. And in a bow, that's a good thing. The other reflex of the root, zawawra, the verb zara yazuru ziyaratan, has particular relevance to Jamil. Um, who here likes visits, going on visits? Fun, right? Paying visits to Buthayna is Jamil's superpower. And this is more or less stated in his poetry. I'll read just the last of these verses from a farewell scene. <clears throat> For all my repeated visits to you, Buthain, I'm about to take extended leave. Practically all of Jamil's exploits can be distilled into that phrase. The reiteration of my visits. Early on in this project, I used to speak of a Jamil cycle of stories about the poet, thinking they would resolve into an arching narrative. I don't call it that anymore. It's more like a string of variations on the same story. We have a handful of reports about how Jamila Bruthina first meet, and her family's opposition is built into these. Then there are a couple of versions of their last meeting, as Jamil is about to leave for Egypt, where he dies off stage. 
between these events, you can put every story of Jamil on shuffle play and it wouldn't make a difference. Just about every one of them is the story of a visit. A lot of them involve messengers and go-betweens. And that's what's going on in these next verses, which were featured on the poster for today's talk. Very hard to read if you're not used to Maghribi script. They're from a poem where Jamil instructs his cousins to carry a message for him. Zura buthainata fahabibu mazuru inna ziyarata lil muhibbi yasiru. Visit Muthaina, you two. The loved one should be visited. For the true lover, visits come easy. And that's another good title, actually. Mm -hmm. Visits come easy. Um, these verses play on an old, yeah, write that down. <laughs> these verses play on an old convention, which is the address to the poet's two companions. So many poems begin with a command to the companions to turn aside from the route they're traveling and contemplate the remains of an encampment. And with this, we finally arrive a deviation as the opener of the classical Qasida. Here is Malayamilu in a nasib of al uh, This one's in the plural and not the dual. Milu iladari min Layla. Turn aside to the abode of Layla and let us read it. Um, we've also got this verse, very famous one by Imru Okais. Uja alatallali. Turn aside to the remains of the abode that we may weep over it as Ibn Hadan did. Um, the dual imperative of Aja Ya Uju is very common in poems of Tawil meter. And you'll recognize this verb as the root of awaj and iwaj, the bend in the stick and the contortion of the affair. <clears throat> I think the analogy between deviation, leaning, and bending is understandable. They're all departures from rectitude. What might not be clear is how the ziyada, the visit, fits into this. After all, the visit is goal-oriented behavior. Jamil's visit to Bethina required planning and effort, so it helps to consult Ibn Fadis, who says in Makayin Salluha that Zawar is mild. And iswarra means to incline away from something. He says, a similar idea is expressed by the active participle za'ir, visitor. Because someone visits you, when someone visits you, they're inclining away from other people. Um, and it's by this logic that the visit is a lean and a turn away. Jara Yajuru works this way too, because Jara Yajuru is to go astray, but your jod is your neighbor that you repair to for protection. And anyway, so you don't get intimacy with someone until you turn away from others. Uh, love sickness in Jamil would be a whole nother talk. It's not medicalized by this poet exactly. We don't get the four humors, but there is a strong sense of compulsion and psychological drive as in the second of these verses from Muntaha Talab. Love has put an impulse at the center of my heart, either something close to death or death itself. Um, and beyond the pleasure principle, Sigmund Freud proposed that Thanatos and Eros are a complementary pair, the death drive and the life force. And critics of Freud ridicule the notion, how could there possibly be a death drive that goes against evolutionary biology? But I don't think they've read enough Jamil. Um, <laughs> the funny thing, or the sad thing, is that the one time Jamil embraces rectitude is when he goes off to his death. This is in the final report of Alahani's chapter on Jamil, an unsatisfying report as everything about Jamil's death is. There's a great article from 1985 by Kamala Najmi with a dozen reasons why Jamil couldn't possibly have gone to Egypt, that it makes no historical sense, that it's an invention of the Ruwat, and I will, uh, with regrets, leave it aside. 
except to say that the death in Egypt answers a basic narrative need. Every tale of disappointed love has to end somehow. And if it isn't they live happily forever after, then um, the career of Jamil's great predecessor, in fact, the only other <laughs> real poet that's really of the tribe of Udra is Urwa ibn Hizan. And his death ends in a long, prolonged wasting away. Uh, and Majnun Layla dies the same way. So I think that for Jamil, that kind of ending was just unsuited. And so his death comes off scene, seemingly with military honors at the court of Abdulaziz bin Marwan, who governed Egypt from 685 to 705. Um, his palace was in Hawan. But all that's narrated is the arrival of the news back in Wadi Okoda and the outpouring of Ruthaina's grief. So Jamil's role as a character in his own life story comes to an end with his intention to depart for Egypt. And here's what he says. This is not from a poem, but from the prose account. Ataitukum li awadi'akum I've come to you to say goodbye. I am resolved to go to Egypt. And what I should have mentioned at the beginning is that ma'il has an opposite, and it's this word amid. In geometry, it means perpendicular, whereas what's ma'il is oblique. And amud is an upright pillar, yeah? And to be amid means to be resolved on something and to intend to do it as Jamil says here. So I am grappling with how much weight to put on this. It seems almost overdetermined that what brings his visits to a close is this resolute intention that's the exact opposite of his leanings, get it? You can even take it as a, as a commentary on Jamil's whole career which is one long indulgence of his mile in a series of visits that come to an end only when he conceives the fatal intention that goes against his every inclination. Uh, the good news is that I'm not gonna be doctrinaire about any of this in our volume. My job, as you know, is to allow Jamil's future readers to make up their own minds. So everything you've heard today might boil down to just a paragraph in the introduction. <laughs> and I thank you for listening today. Thank you, David. It's a rich, uh, interesting, um, fascinating turn in terms of uh, these uh, linguistic and sort of metaphorical um, uh, matters in, uh, in Jamil's poetry. Um, I guess at this point, we'd like to maybe open it up to questions. Looking up words throughout this entire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell my students they should look at their phone during a talk. Um, I was thinking actually uh, about um, this is a micro comment intended to be a larger comment. Um, you know, even the title Masada al Oshak actually has within it. I was like, oh, that's so funny. It's actually the, it's the, you know, the, they fall down. Yes. Right. This is falling. In fact, falling to the ground, literally like a lunatic or something, you fall to the ground. Right. And I thought that was very interesting. I was like, oh, David, you could write a, you know, leaning and falling, mm. falling in the sense of losing. And I wondered if actually in that, there is a different conception of, you know, ishq. That if in one ways you have le leaning, the falling and losing control, and why is that actually a successful title, which it is, and it does sort of encapsulate. And I think it's intentional. I, I always read that as a, you know, a double entendre. Um, and in fact, you know, if you will, could you kind of tell us a little bit? I know this is a big, big question, but it, it was occurring. It occurred to me uh, when you were talking. Um, you know, uh, these metaphors of of leaning, for example. I remember I 
I was asked by uh, my professor, my Persian professor, to go find a book of calligraphy in Iran for him when I went to Tehran. And it was actually, I think the title was Muntahi El Ishq, that is the lean, the lean of, of love and desire, uh, which I think is really an interesting, you know, sort of, I, I don't know. I wonder actually, can you see, maybe to get back to that first bit, do you see this as part of as well an emerging vocabulary? Like you were talking about kind of in one way, a sort of, well, here's, you know, this is something that is, you know, deep, you know, metaphors we live by, George Lakoff kind of thing. But do you also see that in kind of fashioning the, the Othery love story, there's a kind of, like, why, why this, you know, Masar al-Oshak, why that as a as a punning title for them? Why that kind of you know the kind of almost abandoned rather than uh, so I, I just maybe are the are the, are the metaphors almost you know in some ways shaping hmm. the very in as much as you talk about stories but also metaphors and are you kind of pushing back with your kind of metaphorical I mean do you see it that way do you see it as kind of pushing back against a kind of way that. Uh, Jamil Bothena has been understood. Is that what you're kind of up to in a way beyond this paragraph? Uh, Pushing back? No, I don't. Yeah. The power. Um, yeah. No, but I mean, just in terms of conceptually, if you will, like sort of thinking about thinking differently about this, that's a way of kind of getting getting a definition of or an understanding of love that's you know closer to the closer to uh, Jamil. Yes. Well. Yeah. Um, I am. Um, I say I think it's all true. Is yeah. I'm convinced yeah. by this uh, deep structure, mm. if you like, mm. and that leaning and bending and going astray are mm. the same meaning. Uh, with Masada al Shak, <laughs> you know. Okay, so Masada is the plural of Masra, and. I, you know, which is to fall. I think it's a wrestling term. Yes, it absolutely is. To to to, to cause someone to fall, yes. like to I don't know, yes. to pin someone, but come on, that's appealing, right? Because love is a wrestling match in that case. Uh, um, Ishka, I haven't uh, quite delved into, but something I'm seeing on the spot, and this really is speculative linguistics, um, with a number of you of discussed the phenomenon of the uh, kalub, kalb, which is where in Arabic, um, the, you take the, the radicals and you swap the order around and sometimes you get meanings that are very similar, right? Like hummed and mud are the same thing. They both mean praise. And so, so just now on rehearse, Morris is not a plant. <laughs> If sara'a is to fall, sin ra'ain, sa'ara, sin ain ra is one of those verbs for bending. And if I may, this is the most devastating one. Sa'ar, that was the one from la uh, tusayad, don't, don't twist your chicken people. Um, sa'ar is not just contingent. There is a heartbreaking phrase. Kasa'ar adia. In the case of mutilation of the face, you pay the blood wit, which is to say that the, what you pay to the family of the murder victim. Not a unique case, right? For, for cutting off someone's hand, mm -hmm. non-punitively, that you owe dia there, and uh, for um, general mutilation as well. Now, what do these have in common? They're forms of social death. If you don't have a hand, you can't work. And uh, if you have a mutilated face. Uh, so, um, yeah, these are live issues. And, and I, I, I'm not resistant to them. You know, I, I, I do feel seen, if I may, in a uncomfortable way. But, um, um, you know, some like the best disinfectant. I, I don't know what to say. I, 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 um, I'm really convinced of, by this, as I say, and, 
and by the Arabic language, you know, and this isn't just a game. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not mere philology. It is, um, I feel uh, that, well, this is debatable. Has my thinking been enriched? That's for my critics to decide, but <laughs> for my purposes, is, 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 yeah, yeah. I might not like to totally expand oh, by this <laughs> other repertoire of, of vocabulary and terms and the like. I, I would say if I can make a point, it's, I mean, I think it's so basic to Arabic that if you if you look at particularly that beautiful Maghrebi script of the of the verses of Jamil, it's very, very apparent there. Uh, and a lot of metaphors are used about the, 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 the bow of the of the noon and mm. the lance of the alif mm -hmm. and the whole of the Arabic script itself, when you look at it, yes. it relies on the the kind of tension between the, the, the straight and the bent, um, mm. which you get, as you said, in the bow, um, which you get in Cupid's bow, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to bend the side, you have to have your, your Zora or your Ziara to start with, but then you have to be Ahmed and make for the beloved uh, once you've turned the side. But I did have a question, actually. It, it, it's something that didn't come up, and it, it's something we have never discussed. Have you come across, um, you, you know you get the, uh, the saniha and the, the oh, sawaniha yeah. yes. coming French. from the right or the left? Right. The right, and the opposite ones, which Bawareh. are the bawareh. Bawareh. Yeah, the sawaniha and the bawareh. So depending on which side they come from, um, uh, they and are... in some tribes, it's reversed. Oh, is it? <laughs> so yeah. 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 And then, it, like in Ibn Battuta, you get a story about two two Hadis, uh, both of whom were uh, one-eyed. Um, but the, uh, the the one who's Awar in, in his left eye uh, says, uh, uh, "Oh, I am superior to you because I have still got my right eye." So, um, so my question is, uh, as in heraldry um uh you get where well, you get a bend the bend sinister a, and the bend sinister and the bend is a diagonal line on a shield a rank if you like and of course it probably comes from mamluk um blazon um but if it goes one way uh if it goes to the right it's 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 dexter it's it's mm -hmm. positive if it's a bend sinister mm -hmm. to the left it's a mark of Wickedness, um, and maybe um, uh, bastardy, uh, something like that, supposedly. So, have, have you ever come across any uh, differentiation between which way the bending goes? <laughs> um, it, it, it's a kind of. Yeah, I keep a file. I mean, it, yeah. it, <laughs> <laughs> Roger Calois. Yeah. Roger Calois has a book called Dissymmetries, yeah. and it is fantastic. Um, I mean, really approaching the concept of symmetry from the beginning. It's like, because it's not just left right. You have like up and down, yeah. and and um, he talks about amoebas and and microbes, and it's 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 fantastic. Um, all I can say is that it's not. Um, it's not a, like a cultural construction. Okay. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> it's not yeah. just people arbitrarily decide. No, the heart is on one side, and right-handedness is a thing. And yeah. um, the usual explanation for sana and bade is that the sana, which is going in a rightward direction, is easier to hit. Pow, okay. For a right-handed yeah. archer. No, there are. There is are that true? Really? Come on. I mean, because if I'm acting this, I'm no archer, but. That, that's the way I would want to do it. It's like to have my arm extended and be shooting at the leftward <laughs> running target. Shoot you, I wouldn't shoot David. So yeah. I, uh, yeah, it would be. Um, <laughs> and then okay. there's whoever it was who, who watched um, Bain al Qasrain, the busy street in Cairo, and noted that uh, more people walked on the left than on the right. Um, and decided it might have been on Macrizi or someone, and decided it, it was because the heart is is um, no way sort of more <laughs> on the left side. So, um, but 
But anyway, so that's something to watch out for. What the direction of the of the mm -hmm. male. Um, and, then, and, and, so, and and another um, just kind of points that came up. Another metathesis is um, is is the Hana Yahnu and and also Naha. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, you're right. Nahu. Yeah. Nahu. Yeah. <laughs> grammar. You go um, uh, well, the Nahu and grammar as well. I was thinking of Nahu direction. Right. Yeah. Nahu as, as a preposition. Huh. Wow. You can you can Yahnu. You can. Oh my gosh, and you know what else? Somebody. Yeah. Hinaya is an epithet for the bow. Yeah. Or Haniya or something. something. Yeah, exactly. it, it gets involved in bow. And about bent things as well. Something I remember. I remember hearing Yemeni tribesmen um, uh, extemporizing verses about Uj al Karasi. Uj, mm. yeah, Uj al Karasi. And, and the kursi of a, of a gun mm. is its, its stock. Mm. Um, so, and I think they were referring to the kind of curved stocks of old guns, but I've heard them using it for, for um, 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 Kalashnikovs as well, which sort of hinge. So, you know, there's the, the, the Zora bow, it's, it's still, um, it's transferred to modern weaponry. It's not just a description of the figure saying Zora. Yeah. Well, no, exactly. Did you have a question? Don't worry, anybody else have a... Let's see if I can formulate this. Um, David, well, firstly, thank you for such a beautiful, beautiful talk. Um, and uh, sort of building off what Tim was saying in the beginning about Arabic calligraphy and looking at the form and the shapes of letters, I was thinking about um, the material form and aspects of your research that look into artistic process process and creating with real material form. And I know you were just in England um, giving a wonderful, another wonderful talk about um, some of this speculative linguistic research that you're doing. And I'm wondering if there are any intersections there in terms of thinking about, I don't know, weaving and looms and threads and, and movement and process and the body and how this piece of work maybe fits into some of the questions you're asking about artistic practice. Thank you for asking. Uh, the short answer is you'd be surprised how little intersection there is because I am obsessed on the subject of textiles and you'd think I'd be looking for it everywhere and I am. Um, uh, oh, what order to do this in? The, 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 as you know, one of the focuses of that research is on craft metaphors for poetry is where the poet says, my poem is like a robe. If you could wear it, you certainly would, right? Like, um, and we get this at, in the very earliest poems in the corpus. Um, that's not in Jamil. It's, it's, it's uh, funny about Ghazal poetry, right? Because Jamil is, of course, one of the early Ghazal uh, masters. And the moments in the Qasida where the, the poem self thematizes, it's in Mud, which is panegyric, and Hijat, which is invective. I think this is how good my poetry is. It's like a spearhead, it's like an ax, it's like a poison shirt, it's like all these things. Um, you don't get it for that. Let I me mean, think about it. If you were to boast about what a good, you know, what a good like uh, elegist you were, it'd be like saying, I'm a paid mourner, you know? <laughs> or Ghazal, right? You don't boast about how good you are at Ghazal, you just do it. And so we don't get many of these metaphors. In, in, in Jamil. Uh, there is, however, but yeah, there's a, you, you know, Jamil is a great competitor, or not competitor, but tradition sort of opposes Jamil to Umar ibn Abi Rabia, who is the urban Ghazal um, leader, if you like, in Mecca. There is one report, I regret to say, in Kitab al that Omar had a weaving shop 
mm-hmm. with 70 enslaved people weaving for him. And Omar, who loves to talk about luxury goods and weavings and, and silk and musk and all these things, he never talks, he doesn't use the weaving metaphor either. So, um, yeah, it's on my mind. Uh, I guess that the sort of one bit of Jamil that has it, there's a standalone verse that Al Jahid quotes. <laughs> this sure took me forever. Actually, this was, you'll remember our discussion, Jessica, about the Nir, which is the heddle rod. And on uh, the, the, the ground loom that the Bedouin weave, like the fleege, the tent on, um, there's just one heddle. But in the shops, the loom has two heddles. So the, 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 there's kind of two warps, if you understand. And mechanically, they're lifted up and down. And so cloth that's made this way is like of a higher quality. <laughs> there's, a, there's a line where Jamil says, oh, Jamil is, uh, excuse me, she says, he says, Buthaina is better than the other women. He says, she was woven on a, on a loom of two heddles, whereas everybody else is just like a, a watered up scrap of, I mean, it's. But then, make it up. then you said, she, she, was it Buthaina herself who was the lihath? Mm-hmm. That is the, true. The mm-hmm. blanket, yeah. And, and, that, and that's a lovely word, because uh, uh, as I understand it, uh, uh, lehfer or lehaf or whatever is something that you kind of wrap yourself yeah. up in. Yeah, it's, it's that's, that's the bodiest. No, forgive me. <laughs> there is, there is. Uh, it's talking, yeah, it's more about there the There is other stuff, too. Yeah, that's not, that's not, I mean, that is a standout moment, but there's stuff that's equally. Mm. Um, I mean, that's almost like a riddle, right? In what way is a blanket like a woman? Oh, I made you think of it, but I didn't say it. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what Russell's all about, like that double entendre. Um, thank you. Let's go to the question. Any other questions? I don't have a question because I I feel so, like it was really interesting, and I just feel like I have no knowledge. <laughs> like when you know what I mean? Like it's it's enriching in that wonderful way. Where I feel like I don't know very much, and that's a great thing. Negative capability that makes you the smartest. Mm-hmm. Woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I guess kind of along lines of of what Jessica was talking about. Like again, I feel just the obviously the metaphoric potential is infinite, and these kind of ways of how how they relate to us differently, I think is really interesting. Like what it brings out and what we're thinking. Because for me, it was a structural thing, and I was immediately thinking about the storm. Right, that just happened. That that doesn't bend, <laughs> gets ripped down of the ground in Abu Dhabi, hmm. you know. So and just like I, I don't know, I think it's, I think there's so much potentiality and think, so much potential, in kind of looking at the metaphoric and the and the physical and the you know a corporate like all of these. It's just very fascinating. So I don't really have a question, but I really I like it a lot. It's very interesting. So thank you. I think so. Um, one direction that this research could continue. I mean, it's unpublishable, let's face it. Uh, G direction, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't help but sort of talking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> then they can hear me physical term. Sorry, go ahead, sorry. I mean, do, I mean, do you think I should, I mean, I, I should be really doing the work, not. Well, yes, I do. Snooping into the dictionary, like my departed <laughs> master should yuck. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, obviously, this is a fruitful area of study. I mean, it, uh, I had a question as well, just briefly. I mean, is this, when Cavarero's approach is, is um, you know, Marcus is a, a great work of theories that you start realizing, well, of course, mm-hmm. this applies. How do you know? I've never thought of this. Of course, yeah. the, the upright and leaning. And these, these are sort of, you know, intrinsic to how we express our thoughts in the world. And it's not just Arabic, of course, but uh, English, too, has some of these roots in uh, physical metaphors that then, like, them calcified or, or mm-hmm. get um, uh, you know, applied to, to philosophical or ideological things or to other ideas. Um, uh, now, what was I going to say? Um, is this, are we looking at sort of like a postural turn in, in literary studies? I mean, have there been, I mean, I mean, it sounds kind of silly to think about, I mean, but, but it, in some ways, or this is more like an embodied turn, it's sort of studying how. Mm-hmm. Metaphors in literature really are in turn on the idea of the body, meaning crooked or straight. Or, hmm. I or maybe, uh, I uh, haven't read widely enough in recent theoretical 
tradition. I mean, I, so I, I don't know if there's a turn underway. I would join it. I mean, yeah. you know, I don't really have perspective on the matter, but I, th I think it's, I think affect studies already is that, you know, yeah. where the, 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 the affection that is also the outward display and um uh but if there's if there is a turn underway i hope uh um i hope i'm a part of it or i hope that that, that this is uh what i was going to say before about where to, where to where to continue the research would be in to prove well to prove i don't know but there's great sample sets out there and i was just mentioning to you chip of Ibn Sita, the great um lexicographer of Murcia in Spain. And Amuhasas is a thematic diction. Amuhkam is alphabetical, like, you know, dictionaries are. Muhasas is what we call Mubawab. It's everything's organized into thematic chapters. And he has chapters, a whole, I spent so much time reading his chapter on al indi dal which is a chapter on deviation. I, should, I mean, I have it here somewhere. The the I mean it's over 50 verbs. And then he has a chapter on bending at Wajaj, which I have not inspected, but you could do a Venn diagram. How many of these verbs mean the same? And then get the other chapter on erotic inclination and see how many do all three. I mean, that could be a, like an actual spreadsheet. That would be work while research. And maybe I could find someone using Saad which is like the ugliest word for facial deformation that I know, <laughs> finding them using that in a, to mean erotic inclination. That would be delightful. That would be great. Henri. It's not a question, it's a comment. This was a great talk, so great in fact that you've ruined my day because every, ever since you said, try to find a word mm. in any language that is not straight, that has a positive connotation, my left side of my brain is continue to listen to you in the right part and try to find a word. And I have to say, you've ruined my day because I'm going to keep talking, thinking about this. <laughs> Up till now, I haven't found anything, even in French, which is known for, you know, we say so many great things with negative words. Ah, I true. can't find one. Is a language where terrible is a good thing, right? And, and uh, <laughs> I'm not able to find one. So I'll get back to you. But, Oh, thanks for an amazing talk. It was, it was there great. are uh, what we call false friends as well. Yeah. Um, the wicket, the bent hoop that you used to play, <laughs> cro play croquet with. I always assumed that that was related to the English word wicked. What's a wicket? A wicket is um, when you you sort of a wicket gate. It's a it's a a hoop that you. Well, in croquet, it's a very small oh, yeah. hoop of metal. Okay. Half a hoop, you know, a semicircle. And but you can have a gate and there might be a trellis and you walk through it. And that's related to wicker, I guess. Wicked turns out to be related to wicca, like witchcraft. And they're not the same. So um, but uh, that's very generous of you, Henri. And and do please keep up the search. And the the, the challenge is genuine, like it's a it's a no, it's not a challenge. I mean, it is a challenge. It's a challenge. I it's know, an I invitation. Know to challenge that. <laughs> I, know exactly what to do. I mean, I'll pay a bounty. You know what I mean? I, I'll, I will. What will you accept? Will you accept a time when a poet has used the negative valuation of a word for like, I yes. can think, can you? So, yeah. so I can think of Emily Dick, Dickinson's Tell the Truth or Tell It Slant. Ah, uh, yeah. but, but she's using it to defend your point she's using it because it has a negative valuation mm -hmm. and she's making it positive. So I, I don't know, slant, uh, I think for the most part, slant is a negative uh, valence, I would yeah. probably think, uh, but it is, it is in terms of the poem, it's used mm -hmm. so poetically, mm -hmm. so I wouldn't accept it. I'd throw okay. that out. <laughs> you look askance on things, yes. if, you're, if you're morally superior. Yes. But at the same time, I think somebody said Kavafi looked askance to 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 write his poetry he didn't look straight on 
So, so the, the challenge is to find something that's like negative, but not. I'm, I'm yeah, totally confused. The challenge is to find a word in any language <laughs> for yeah. crooked. Wabi sabi. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the Japanese word for the, for like the tree that yeah yeah you can make bonsai out of. Oh, for sure. Symmetrical. Oh, for sure. Pleasingly, yes. Yeah. Wabi sabi. Hmm. So there we go. Wow. <laughs> okay. Is it though? Is it part of that? My day is safe. And there's a, there's a beautiful song that celebrates um, lack of straightness, um, which I might have tried to sing to you. <laughs> well, I, if I remember, it's Flanders and Swan, <laughs> um, the honeysuckle and the bindweed. Um, I bind. We're still the recording. Left, and you yeah. bind to the right. And, uh, uh, what, the, the honeysuckle binds to the left and the bindweed binds to the right, I think. Um, and they embrace each other. Mm. Um, there's also no accounting for personal mania. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God, or I... There's I, a title for you. <laughs> no, I mean, I've really benefited from that in my life. I, um, I, I think it's possible to positively value all sorts of things. Yeah. And this is what paraphilia is. Um, but I think with Wabi Sabi, Alex, you really. Maybe you then go to aesthetic traditions yeah. to look for this language, because mm. in artistic practice and even musical practice, from what I know, for example, about like improvisational jazz, I mean, that is a positive, like those aesthetic concepts that are behind the actual practice do that value positively mm -hmm. deviation and mm -hmm. um what is not straight yeah like a minor key too yeah, yeah. The minor key the yeah. the word baroque if i may um is from portuguese barroco is a pearl it is not round yeah and if you think of the baroque it's about like elongated so that is the baroque value um and what do you call those Corkscrew columns. Bali Bali in 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 I've only seen them in paintings, but they're like Rococo mm -hmm. kind of. Mm -hmm. I, I should I should just I should follow that suggestion. Thank you. But what about all those slender waisted beloveds yeah. who 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 um may, yes. who lean on the, <laughs> yes exactly um it's like a limber reed they sway. True, yeah. true. The inhidad, yeah. of the, the the bending without breaking, like a shoot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Oh, always the beloved is like a husen. Yes. Yeah, like a branch that 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 bends, and that's that's mm -hmm. appealing. That's not jointed though, and it is also mm -hmm. moving. Mm -hmm. You know. I think a crook is something that's rigid and indurated, and uh, um, that would be my. If we had uh, Chip's postural studies, um, <laughs> well, I, I was thinking actually about just the very that you know, so context in which poets stood straight. Did they lean? Did they inflect? Do we have descriptions of what poets? We do actually. We have it in, uh, uh, you know, certainly uh, Abu Tamam talked about. So it would be, they talk a lot about voice, but not maybe posture. It'd be interesting to look in the Makamat. I think there are sometimes descriptions of the way people are sitting uh, and reciting, which I thought was interesting, but mostly I think they stood. And I'm, I'm thinking about that, like he stood erect and he said, or was he leaning when he said, or that kind of thing. I have a habit of Kuthayir where he is, um, reciting Jamil. Yeah. And he's walking around the room oh, and he's rapping and re-rapping himself oh, and saying, oh, Jamil's the best poet. Jamil's the best poet. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish I could remember now. I'll, I'll definitely go back yeah. uh, to that. Of course, <laughs> the usual thing you read is about the hearers of the poetry. Inclining. Mm -hmm. And tearing their, their, yes. their, their, yes, their garments open, which is like the highest compliment you can pay. Wow. Three cheers for poetry. Thanks for yeah. sticking around. <laughs> this is um, 
That's encouraging. Yeah. Um, unless there's any more questions. Well, then, um, I guess if we're all done, thank you, David. It's been a great thank talk. You. Thank you. Great questions. Thank you. Thank you.